Today on Touching Lives. Every person on this planet belongs to God. Every person. Doesn't matter whether they go to church or don't go to church. Doesn't matter whether they believe in the Bible or not. Doesn't even matter if they believe in God or not. God made every person, God created every person, God owns every person, every person belongs to God. And God says, listen, I care about people who are lost. Lost people matter to God. And what matters to God ought to matter to us. With hope and encouragement for life, this is Touching Lives with James Merritt. You brought a copy of God's Word this morning. I want you to turn to the third gospel. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to turn to the gospel of Luke, the 15th chapter. And while you're turning, it's really important to understand this parable. you got to know who Jesus was telling the parable to. Then you'll know why he told the parable. So we're going to look here in, in Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Almost every time Jesus told a story, there were always two groups of people hanging around. There was what we would call today the rebellious crowd, and there was what we might call today the religious crowd. Uh, there was, you know, some people would call it the wrong crowd. Some people would call it the right crowd. Now, the Pharisees, if you remember, they were, or at least they considered themselves to be in the right crowd. They were the crowd that went to church. They were the crowd that gave offerings. They were the crowd that did good things. They were the crowd that dotted the I's and crossed the T's. They thought they were in the right crowd. And what drove them nuts about Jesus was he never hung around with the right crowd. He always hung around with the wrong crowd. And they, 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 they didn't get it. They said, we don't understand. You claim to be the Son of God, but you hang around with sinners. You, you claim to be the Son of God, and you hang around with people who don't even go to church. You claim to be the Son of God, and you hang around people who don't even have time for God. Why do you hang around with sinful people? And he loved it. Andy Stanley put it best when he said, people who are nothing like Jesus, like Jesus. And Jesus liked people who were nothing like him. And when you read about Jesus, it's so fascinating. Sinners would flock to hear Jesus. Pharisees would get in the ear of Jesus. They were hungry for truth. The Pharisees were hungry for blood. And the reason why the Pharisees didn't understand why Jesus hung around with sinners is because, first of all, they didn't see sinners the way God sees sinners. And number two, they didn't even see themselves as sinners. See, they saw sinners the way a lot of us see sinners. And let's be honest. We all have our particular category we pick out, right? For some of you, it's the pimp. For some of you, it's the prostitute. For some of you, it's the adulterer. For some of you, it's the homosexual. For some of you, it's the fornicator. For some of you, it's the thief. For some of you, it's the terrorist. For some of you, it's the robber. But we look down. We look on sinners as being losers. God doesn't look at sinners as being losers. God looks at sinners as being lost. Hanging around with the wrong crowd is very dangerous if you're not spiritually mature enough to influence them rather than them influencing you. And I get that. But where you and I have been told all of our lives, don't ever hang around with the wrong crowd, let me tell you what you're going to learn in this parable. It is not the job of those who think they are the right crowd to look down on those who they think are in the wrong crowd. That's not our job. If you're here this morning and you say, man, I'm in the right crowd, look where I am today. That ought to tell you where I am. I'm in church. I'm not at the lake. I'm not in the mountains. I'm not this. I, I mean, I'm with the right crowd. It is the job of the right crowd to look for the wrong crowd because there's only one difference between the right crowd and the wrong crowd. And here's the difference. The right crowd has been found. The wrong crowd is still lost. That's the only difference. So it's not the job of the right crowd to look down on the lost crowd. It's the job of the right crowd to look for the lost crowd and share with them how to get into the right crowd. Jesus tells a parable, one of the, one of the most beautiful parables in all of the New Testament. And he tells those of us who think we're in the right crowd, here's how you ought to see people who are in the wrong crowd or who you think are in the wrong crowd. Here's how you ought to see people who are lost. Three things I want to share real quick. Number one, we ought to have a consternation over people who are lost. Now, that word consternation is a big word. It just simply means to be, to, to be churned up about it, to be really worked up over it. We ought to have a consternation. We'll read here in verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after one that is lost until he finds it? Now, that is actually a rhetorical question. 
Because for once, Jesus finally found something that everybody could agree on. The sinners agreed with it. The tax collectors agreed with it. The Pharisees agreed with it. The scribes agreed with it. The Sadducees agreed with it. Everybody agreed, yep, that's right. A shepherd ought to go after a lost sheep because anybody knows that a good shepherd doesn't care about some of the flock. A good shepherd doesn't care about most of the flock. A good she shepherd cares about who? He cares about all of the flock. So they said, yeah, you're right. We know that a good shepherd would go after a lost sheep. Now, what's so sad about a sheep that's lost is this. A sheep that's lost doesn't even know it's lost. That, that's why when a sheep wanders off, and it's just a natural tendency, as you know, for sheep to wander away, the reason why a lost sheep will never come back is two reasons. Number one, they don't even know they're lost. And number two, even if they did, they don't know how to find their way back. Now, it, it, it's, it's a bad thing to be lost. That's really bad. But you know what's even bad, even worse, is you don't even realize it. Then Jesus says, let's talk about a coin that's lost. Verse 8, or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. Now, Jesus is describing there a very typical situation back in, back in his day. There was a woman, she was obviously, as you're going to see, not very, very, very rich. She lived in a very small Palestinian home. Back in that day, a Palestinian home would be about the size today of a one-car garage. Didn't have any windows. It only had one door. They could only let sunlight in when the weather was warm. So most of the time, the house would be, A, very dark, B, very cold. This is a woman. She's not wealthy. She only has 10 coins to her name, and she loses one Coin. Now, I'm going to tell you in just a moment that that coin really isn't worth all that much, but all of a sudden she realizes, my coin's lost. I've got nine, but I, I don't have ten. One of them's gone. And, she, and, and Jesus said she immediately begins to turn her house upside down, inside out, trying to find that one lost coin. Now, this raises a big question. Why did the shepherd go look for one sheep? And why would a woman go look for one coin? And, and, and there's only one explanation. You kind of read it here in, in Scripture. There can only be one because it bothered them and it burdened them that they were lost. Now, let me ask you a simple question. Let's see how, how, much, you, how much you can kind of figure out what's going on here. How did the shepherd know that sheep was lost? How did that woman know the coin was lost? How did they know? Somebody tell me. How did they know? They counted right? He counts. I got 99. Whoa, I'm missing a sheep here. She counts. Whoa, there's only nine coins. I'm missing a coin. The sheep, the shepherd counted the sheep. The woman counted the silver. And I just say that, just, just kind of say this and move on. I really shake my head sometimes when I hear people say, I don't know why the church is so concerned about numbers. I'll tell you why. Because God's concerned about numbers. I mean, People are not numbers, but numbers many times are people. And the reason why we ought to be concerned about numbers in our church is because people count. So why was it a big deal to that shepherd? Because it was his sheep. Why was it a big deal to that woman? Because it was her coin. And what Jesus is saying is this. Every person on this planet belongs to God. Every person. Doesn't matter whether they go to church or don't go to church. Doesn't matter whether they believe in the Bible or not. Doesn't even matter if they believe in God or not. God made every person, God created every person, God owns every person, every person belongs to God. And God says, listen, I care about people who are lost. Lost people matter to God. And what matters to God ought to matter to us. So I'm telling us as a church, there ought to be constant, listen, let me tell you something. You don't get this parable, you don't, even, you don't understand the mind of God if you don't understand that if you're sitting next to an empty seat right now, it ought to bother you. If you're sitting next to an empty seat right now, it ought to burden you. If you're sitting next to an empty seat right now, it ought to break your heart. Because every empty seat is somebody out there that's lost. They don't even know that they're lost, and nobody evidently has cared enough to say, you're lost, let me help you be found by God. See, we come in here, and if we're 80% or 90% filled, we think we ought to be thrilled. If Jesus came in here, he'd say, why isn't my house full? Well, what are these empty seats here? Because God cares about lost people. 
Lost people matter to God, therefore they ought to matter to us. There ought to be consternation in this church. We, every one of us ought to leave here every Sunday burdened that there are empty seats in this building. There ought to be consternation in your home group. There ought to be consternation in your family over your neighborhood. There ought to be consternation in your heart individually that you work with people and you live in neighborhoods and you do life together with people who are lost. Say that word with me. Lost. Jesus said something else. We ought to focus our concentration on people who are lost. Now notice again what the shepherd does, verse 4. What man of you? Having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after one that is lost until he finds it. Here's a shepherd. He counts. He's missing one sheep. He leaves the 99 in the pen to fend for themselves, and he goes out looking for this one lost sheep. Same with a woman. Verse 8, what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, doesn't light a lamp, sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it. She forgets she's got nine coins left. She doesn't, doesn't care about that. I've got to find this one lost coin. By the way, when it says she searched diligently, that word diligently is a really interesting word. It's only used one time in the whole Bible right here. And it's a word that literally refers to obeying the command of a king. In Bible days, if a king gave you a command, it instantly became a matter of life and death because if you didn't carry, carry out the command, you were guilty. You could, you could be put to death. That's the word that's used here. This woman, when she lost that coin, said, this is a matter of life and death to me. This is that important. I'm going to turn this place upside down. I'm going to light the lamps. I'm going to sweep the floors. I'm going to look in every corner and every crook and every crevice till I find this coin. Now, let me tell you what's so amazing. You would think, well, boy, it must be a valuable coin. Not so. The Greek word for coin here is the word drachma. It's only used here in the New Testament. You ready for this? Do you know how much that one coin would be worth in today's money? 18 cents. It wasn't even a day's wage for an ordinary hourly worker in Bible days. 18 cents. You lost one sheep, dude. You still got 99. Now, you, you business people out here, if you're a business person, you'd have to agree. Losing one out of a hundred is just not bad, right? I mean, if I came to you today and, and, and I said, look, I don't know what your, 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 your business is, but what would you pay me if I could guarantee you a 99% profit margin? I'd say, man, you're the CEO today. I'm Man, we're, we're hiring you, right? Or, or what if I came to you and said, I'll guarantee you a 90% profit margin. Man, you're in. You go into Kroger's, go into Publix, go into Winn-Dixon. You know what the profit margin is of a grocery store? One to two cents out of a dollar. One to two percent. If I go to Kroger's today and I walk in and say, I'm going to show you a plan where you're going to make 99% on your groceries, I'm going to Disney World. Well, wait a minute. So why would a shepherd go after one sheep? Why would a woman worry about one coin? Because one sheep by itself is not valuable. Wasn't then, not now. I've already told you, one coin today is worth a dime, a nickel, and three pennies. So why did they do that? There's only one reason, because they had a love and a compassion and a passion for the one that was lost. Now, I want you to hear this. If you don't hear anything else I said today, I want you to hear this. Do you know what made that sheep, that one sheep, so valuable? Do you know what made that one coin so valuable? It was the love and the care and the concern for the one that lost it. I want you to hear this. Jesus does not love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because Jesus loves us. You are infinite value. Why did God send Jesus? To look for you. Why did God send Jesus? Because you were lost and you needed, we needed to be found. Why did God send Jesus? 
because he cares about the one that's lost. And oh, by the way, something else the coin and the sheep had in common, you know what it was? They both were found. You ever, you ever thought about that? Can I let you in a little secret? Lost things don't find themselves. You know, I've heard people say this. We've all said this sometime or another, and it's one of the dumbest things you could ever say. You know, let's say you, let's say you lose your car keys. And how many times have you said this? Well, they'll turn up. Now, how stupid is that? <laughs> you really think you're going to be laying in bed one night, and your car keys are going to come walking in and going, did you miss me yet? <laughs> no, they're not going to turn up. Lost things don't find themselves. They're found, and here's the point. What Jesus is saying is, if you're in the family of God today, it's not because you found God, it's because God found you. I heard about a little girl that lived next to a big forest, and one day she wandered off into the woods to explore, and you can imagine what happened real soon. She got lost, couldn't find her way back. Darkness began to descend. Fear began to grip her heart. She began to scream and cry and weep. Finally, she was so exhausted, she lay down and went to sleep. It wasn't long until her father realized she was lost. He goes out looking for her. He looked for about two hours. He kept calling her name. And finally, he sees her laying on this patch of grass. She's at, you know, she's sound asleep. He begins to call her name. She wakes up. She sees him. She gets up. She runs into his arms. She jumps into his arms. She hugs him. She kissed him. And then she said, Daddy, I am so glad I found you. <laughs> she didn't find him. He found her. You don't find God. God finds you. And you know why? He's looking. He is always concentrating on this. Let me tell you why this is such a big deal. If I were to die today, and who knows, I may die today, but if I die next week or whatever, or if I live long enough to turn this thing over to somebody else, remember what I'm about to tell you. Let me tell you the greatest danger this church will face always, always will be the greatest danger. It, the danger that every church faces, and it's the reason why churches die, it's the reason why churches go to dust, it's the reason why churches close up shop, Churches die because they, there's this tendency to focus inward. Let's just take care of what we got. We got a good thing going here. Everybody seems to love everybody. Everybody gets along. Things are peaceable. Nobody's fussing at each other. You know, we got a few Florida fans, but we deal with them. <laughs> and, let's... and as long as we have the heart and the mind of God, we'll never focus inward. We'll always focus outward. As long as we have the heart and mind of God, we won't, walk out, we won't walk out of here smugly satisfied. Well, at least that seat was filled. Well, at least that seat was filled. Was at least that seat was filled. No, we'll walk in here with the heart and mind of God and say, but what about that seat? Who ought to be in that seat? Who ought to be in those seats? We'll care about those that are lost. We'll concentrate on people who are lost. Last thing, we should expect, express celebration when lost people are found. Now, if you'd been listening to this story, you, would have, you, you, you could have helped it. You would have laughed the way Jesus ends his story. Because the way he ends his story is really, in a way, kind of unrealistic. Matter of fact, if you'd been listening to this story and you'd been tracking with Jesus, you would have been drawn in to the conclusion, and then you'd been scratching your head going, wait, whoa, whoa, that, that doesn't really make any sense. Because look what the shepherd does. He throws a party. And look what the woman does. She throws a party. Verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors. Now, when you called friends and neighbors together, it was the law of hospitality in the Middle East. You had to provide a spread. You had to have a buffet. You had to have the wine and the food and the fried chicken and the grits. I mean, you had to have a buffet. He calls his friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. I have found my sheep that was lost. The woman, verse 9, when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me. I have found the coin that I was lost. Now, just imagine. The shepherd throws this big party, and all of his friends and all of his neighbors come in, and man, they got this big buffet and this big spread. He's killed the fatted calf. He's got all the wine. I mean, everything is just, they can't believe it, but they don't know why he's throwing a party. So they sit down to eat, and one of the neighbors finally has enough courage to say, hey, I just got to ask a question. So what's the occasion? Why are you throwing that party? And the shepherd points to this one little old scraggly sheep over in the corner. He says, that sheep was lost, but I found him. That's, that's it? You cook grits over that? You had this catered from Waffle House over that? <laughs> oh, man, yeah. The, well, but sheep are just property. And losing the sheep every now and then, that's just the cost of doing business. I, how about the woman? Remember I told you how much the drop was worth? 18 cents? Now, listen, this is what's amazing. 
celebrating a sheep, well, that, that's kind of strange enough. But these women, wait a minute, the woman is throwing a party over a coin? The coin's worth less than the sheep. As a matter of fact, are you ready for this? The woman threw a party that cost more than the coin that she lost. Some of you are going, I'm married to her. And now listen. <laughs> why does Jesus put that in the story? He didn't have to put Why does Jesus put that in the story? Because he wants us to understand lost people matter to God and what matters to God should matter to us. And heaven is happy. Heaven throws a party. Heaven celebrates only once when lost people are found. And the way he concludes this story, remember who he's talking to, the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees, they're like, they're they're drawing in and they're so interested. And then the way Jesus closes this story, it's like a gut punch to these Pharisees. Listen to how he ends it, verse 7. Just so I tell you, and I believe he looked right at the Pharisees when he said this, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Just so I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, just think about that. Every time one person repents, every time one person gets right with God, every time one person surrenders their life to Jesus Christ, every time one person is found, one lost person is found, God says, it's party time. Break out the food. Break out the drink. I got to thinking the other day, you know, the angels. Angels are always in the presence of God, right? Not that there's time in heaven, but just pretend there is. 24-7, they're in the presence of God. And I got to reading this and thinking about it. Can you just imagine this? You know, the angels are kind of, they're kind of sitting around, and all of a sudden, they see God get up off the throne. He starts dancing and laughing and carrying on, and, and you know, just, just gooping and hollering. And one of the angels looks at another and says, there he goes again. You know what happened? Well, no, I'm kind of new to the place. Well, somebody else just, just, just got found. So somebody else just repented. Somebody else just surrendered to Jesus. You know why? Nothing makes God sadder than people who are lost, and nothing makes God gladder than when people are found. But Jesus said, God throws a party every time lost people are found. God is not happy when we tell him how right we are, God is happy when we confess how bad we are. God doesn't get happy because we're in the right crowd. God gets happy when the right crowd goes looking for the wrong crowd to help them get into the right crowd. So now, I hope a light's coming on in this room. It's because lost people matter to God. And what matters to God should matter to us. It is because heaven is happy when lost people are found, and we ought to want to make heaven happy. That's why the most important question that a church should always be asking is this question. And if you're part of a church that's not asking this question, go find another church. The most important question a church ought to be asking every single week is not, how much is this going to cost? The most important question a church ought to be asking every week is not, will everybody like this? The most important question a church ought to be asking every week is, will this make me uncomfortable? The most important question a church ought to be asking itself every single week is, if we do this, will more lost people get found? If we do this, Will more people come into a saving relationship with God through Jesus Christ? If we, if we do this, will more people's lives be changed by the gospel of Jesus? You know, one time I lost a credit card. When I lost that credit card, I forgot about every other credit card I had in my wallet. I focused my complete attention on the credit card I didn't have. When I looked in, when I finally realized that my credit card was gone and I didn't have that credit card, you know what I did? I'll tell you what I didn't do. I didn't call all the credit card companies of the cards that I still had to say, hey, I was just calling you to let you know I still have your card. I just wanted you to know I hadn't lost your card. Well, you know who I called? I called the credit card company of the card I'd lost. I said, hey, I got a problem. I have lost your 
card. Why do I tell you that? Because one human soul, one human being, one person, black, white, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat, couldn't care less, one person is worth more than all the credit you could put on every credit card in this universe. Lost people matter to God. And what matters to God ought to matter to us. And heaven is happy when lost people get found. Sharing our faith with those who don't yet know Jesus can be scary. But Jesus called us all to share the gospel. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Call Touching Lives at 800-413-1131 and we'll pray together for the lost around you as you begin to share your faith with them. Whether in the world of entertainment or education, storytelling is one of the most powerful forms of communication known to man. Jesus knew this. He often told stories as he taught during his years of ministry on the earth. He used parables to give us insight into God, his kingdom, and how we should represent him and his kingdom as followers of Christ. In the series Snapshots, Dr. Merritt takes a fresh look at eight of Jesus's parables and highlights their importance to us today. Discover new insights from these timeless messages and learn to see the world through the lens of grace. Order your copy of Snapshots by calling 800-413-1131 or go to touchinglives.org. We all need hope and encouragement, but no one needs it more than the one who has yet to make Jesus the Lord over his or her life. The Ministry of Touching Lives continues to be a voice of hope and encouragement through every available outlet because of the faithfulness of our partners. Thank you for joining us on this journey.